Welcome everybody. My name is Allison Sapinski and I work on the education team at National Geographic. We are so excited to have all of you here um, and to really have you participate in this amazing day of exploration um, featuring women who work in the sciences and the fields of exploration all around the world. Um, it's really my pleasure to have you get to hear from an amazing National Geographic emerging explorer named Jennifer Adler. Um, Jennifer is based in Florida and is a conservation photographer who's pursuing her PhD at the University of Florida. She's blending science, writing, photography. She's using all of these to communicate what's happening in our aquifers beneath our feet. Um, she's been working on a 360 degree virtual tour of the Floridan aquifer um, and she's really passionate about the ocean. It's been something she's loved since she was young. Uh, Jennifer is joining us I don't hear anything here either. This event's been happening all day. Uh, and with that, hopefully, the class can hear us. Can you invite us and ask you? I want to say hi, though. Hi, what's up, dude? All right, so Mrs. Morris, class can hear us. If you wouldn't mind muting your microphone. <laughs> When you did the test, call the media. I think they're going to be a note up for this. Yeah. 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 I'll be you. Wait, no. Wait, mute it. She's asking. 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 Um, we're just going to ask that all the classes are muted. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll introduce Jennifer Adler again. Thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to be here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm excited to share with you today some of the projects that I've been working on in the aquifer. So I want to just start by asking everyone to think about how they started their day. So what did you do? Did you drink a glass of water? Maybe take a shower? Um, wash your hands? What did you do? So all these things involve water and I want you to think about where that water came from. So your answer really to this question is going to depend on where you live. So people in different parts of the world get their water in different ways. For example, in the Turks and Caicos and in Bermuda, people get their water from rainwater that collects on their specially designed roofs. And in places like Ila Holbosch in Mexico, all of their drinkable water is brought in from the mainland or they filter it by a really expensive and energy intensive process on the island and they have to drink out of these jugs here. So of all of the water on our planet, only about 3% of it is fresh. But most of the fresh water that we have is frozen, frozen in glaciers and ice caps. So of the tiny, tiny fraction of liquid fresh water that's actually left, most of it is in aquifers. And there's actually more liquid fresh water underground in aquifers than we can see above the ground. But what exactly is an aquifer? Because we can't see them, they tend to be kind of confusing. And sometimes people think an aquifer is a big underground pond or lake. What it actually is, is just rock that's saturated with water. So with, here's a map of some of the major aquifers here in the US. And there are different types, which basically means they're made up of different kinds of rock. And the different types of rock here are represented by the different colors on the map. And I live down here in Florida, where actually 92% of our population gets their drinking water from the aquifer. And that's about 18 million people. And Jennifer, I like to say that we can walk. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're, just like say, We're having some trouble seeing your screen, but it looks like it's just loading now. So thank you. Oh, it's just loading now? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. We're, we're back on. Did you see any of the slides before um, this? No, it's just getting started. But feel free to pick up right where you're at. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I was just showing. Can you see it when I move it now? Yes, we're seeing it now. Thank you. It's a map of an aquifer now. Yes, we've got it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I'm down here in Florida, like I said, and and I like to walk on water because there's so much water beneath our feet in the Florida aquifer. 
And what's neat about the Floridan aquifer is that it's recharged by rain, uh, which means that when it rains, the water refills the aquifer. And in Florida, the aquifer is made of limestone, and when it rains, the raindrops are actually made slightly acidic by when they form with carbon dioxide, and they form carbonic acid and actually disintegrates the rock little by little and allows the rock to hold water. And a way I like to think of this is, you, if you think about Swiss cheese, how it has holes in it like that, that's kind of what limestone looks like. And so you can hold water in these tiny spaces in the rock. But another really neat thing about the Floridan aquifer is that it supplies water to the highest density of freshwater springs in the world. There are more than 1,000 of these springs in Florida. And what a spring is, is you can see it represented by these blue dots on the map. So there's basically more than 1,000 of these dots. And a spring is just a place where the groundwater from the aquifer comes up to meet the surface. And we can actually swim in these springs and then go directly underground into the aquifer. So this is what it looks like just beneath the surface. And you can see a cave entrance here right in the middle of this photo. And the water is really, really clear as you can see here. And when I swim down even 30 or 40 feet down into the water and look back up towards the sky, the water is so clear that it almost looks like my friend is sort of flying above my head and you can still see the treetops from looking down underwater. So even looking at maps of aquifers, kind of like I showed you guys before, and um, sort of trying to understand what they are, it can still be confusing without actually experiencing it. So I want you guys to come with me on a cave dive. So to get into the aquifer, we need to have our cave diving certification, and it takes a lot of time, equipment, and training, but really what happens is most people go their entire lives without seeing the aquifer or even knowing it's there. So I wanted to be able to share it with other people like you guys. So I do take a lot of pictures in the aquifer, but I also wanted to create, and this is what it looks like down there, and I also wanted to create a 360 virtual tour so that anyone can kind of more feel like they're taking the dive with me and immersing themselves. So a way to think about this is that it's basically Google Street View, if you guys, any of you guys have ever used that, but in an underwater cave. So I want to show you a little bit what it looks like to, what the gear looks like that I use to take these pictures. So I'm going to come back and turn off my screen share so that you can see me again. And I want to show you some of the, the cameras that we use. So hopefully the screen share will work when I go back to show you the slides again. I'm sorry about that. But basically what we have for using stuff underwater is we have a regular camera like this. So and what you can see here um, is this lens that looks like looks kind of funky and that's called a fisheye lens. So what this does is it can see 180 degree field of view. So when I'm looking at you like this, I can see basically all the way over here on my left from all the way over here on my right. But this is not waterproof, so we can't bring this underwater. So what we do is we take our underwater housing. It looks like this. It looks like a giant eye. And so this here is the big dome port. So this is a big clear port. And then what we do is we actually take and we put this camera inside the housing. So let me tip you guys down a little bit so you can see. You should be able to see that. So this camera here slides right in to this housing like this so that it can be kept waterproof. Slides right in there. And then what we have here also is this special, then another piece goes in the back here to keep it waterproof. But we also have is this special piece of metal on the bottom right here that's screwed into my camera. So what I do when I take the 360 pictures is I put this onto a tripod and then you can take pictures all the way around in a circle. So I'll take between four and eight pictures around in a circle and then one picture up towards the sky and then one picture down towards the ground and then I can stitch them all together to make these pictures, these 360 pictures. We also need a lot of light when we're doing this. So I'll have a lot of strobes of means. Strobes is just a fancy word for light that we use underwater. And in some of the 360 images we were taking, there were up to 12 lights in the water. So I wanna show you guys some pictures from being in the aquifer when we were shooting this virtual tour. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys my screen again. And let me know if it doesn't work this time. So can you guys see it? Yes. 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 
Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. 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 Okay. Awesome. So it's a picture of a girl standing at the water. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So this girl here is my friend Leah, and she helped me with a lot of being in the caves. And She's standing here at Ginny Springs, which is a place that uh, is a clear spring about 45 minutes north of where I am now in Gainesville. And you can see the clear water in the front of the picture and then this darker water in the back of the picture. And so in this darker water, it's actually not dirty. This is the Santa Fe River and it's called tannic water and the leaves are on the floodplain stain the water kind of like tea. So sort of like tea turns your water brown, the leaves turn the water brown here. And so this buoy here is actually chained to the entrance to an underwater cave. And so if we zoom out, we take our drone and we fly over the river, this is what it looks like from a bird's eye view. And you can see, if you look very closely at the end of that arrow, you can still see that pink buoy there. And you can see the dark river on the top and then the clear spring water on the bottom. And what you can't see for still from looking at this picture is more than six miles of mapped underwater cave that are just beneath the surface. And so this cave is where I dive down into to make the tour. So I chose nine locations within the cave to shoot these 360 images using that camera that I just showed you. And if we zoom down in here onto number three, this is the entrance to the cave. And this cave entrance is called Devil's Eye Cave. And it's because when you're down at the bottom and you look up, it's like a perfect eye shape when you look up towards the sky. And as you can see, there are still free divers that are in the water here. This kid is diving down kind of near the top and there's someone on a paddle board. But in order to go past this point, you need to be dressed like a cave diver, which you can see this guy at the bottom is. And he has two tanks on his side and he has something in his mouth that's called a regulator. And that's where the air comes out of the tank, up a hose and then into his mouth. And then he has computers and these big giant fins on. So this is what I look like when I take that camera that I just showed you into the water. So the camera is on a tripod and I have to, it's really important to try to keep the camera in one spot as I rotate it around because I have to go back to the computer afterwards and stitch the pictures together. So it makes it a lot easier if I've kept the camera in the same spot. This is what it looks like when I go take take all those pictures. So each of these little red boxes here represents an individual picture that's been stitched together. And then we have the bottom picture and top pictures, and pictures number seven and eight there. And those are kind of stretched out because what's gonna actually end up happening after this stage, once you blend all the pictures together, is that they get turned into this 360 image. So I'm not sure if the video is gonna play for you or not, but what's happening now is that we're sitting at the bottom of Devil's Eye and we're moving around in a circle. And this is that same picture that I just showed you once it's finished and you can move, take your mouse and you can move all around to look up to the sky and see, get this feeling kind of that you're at the bottom of this circular virtual or this circular spring vent. But doing this in the caves is a little bit more complicated because these caves are completely pitch dark. And so in order to take a picture, you have to use a lot of light. And so, like I said, we had a lot of times up to 12 lights in the cave at once. And there's also a lot of flow in there. The water is not just sitting there in the cave. It's moving really fast out towards the spring where you enter. So you have to make sure that the camera doesn't tip over when it's on the tripod. So I would have to stand there and hold it down while someone else, like my dive buddy here, would have to go and help move the lights around to make sure the lighting was even in all the pictures. And so this dark, really dark spot you see there on the left, kind of behind my dive buddy, it might look just like a, you know, a little passageway, but it's actually big enough to drive a bus through. So we had to light up that whole spot so that when you're standing in one place or swimming through one place in the virtual tour, you can see where you're going next. This is what I look like when I'm in the water with the in in the cave. So with the camera, it's on the tripod, and I kind of have it balanced on this little ledge here. And you can see one of the lights kind of there on the left hand side with the orange tape on it. And what if you look up at the surface, you know, there's rock completely above our heads, and that's the limestone rock that I was telling you about. And what those little reflective pieces are on the ceiling there are actually trapped air bubbles. So when we exhale, our air can't make it up to the surface, so it gets trapped on the ceiling and makes these little um, really reflective mirror-like looking pockets.
So I want to give you a brief little spin through of the virtual tour and since I don't think video will work very well on here, I'm going to just show you some pictures of it and then I'll give you the link at the end so you can explore it yourself. So you and click to enter the aquifer and then you swim into this cavern and at the bottom of the cavern this little sort of circular entrance here in the middle is actually where you enter the whole cave. And so you can click from spot to spot using these little triangles and then you can click on little camera icons. And this camera icon here is actually above a sign that we call the Grim Reaper sign in cave diving because it's outside the entrance to a lot of all the caves in Florida and it tells you to stop and prevent your death and go no further if you're not, basically if you're not cave certified because there's nothing in the cave worth dying for if you're not, um, if you're not certified to go in there. And you see that there's also this gray map on the top right that tells you that we're at sphere number four right now. Another thing you can do when you click on other pictures is explore other things throughout the cave. For example, there's this one passageway in the cave that has sand dollars in it. And the, the cave, the water is fresh. And so the sand dollars ended up there because Florida actually used to be um, a shallow, have a shallow sea on it. So there used to be, this used to be a marine environment before it was a cave. And I can tell you guys more about that later if you would like, or you can actually read about it if you visit the virtual tour. So like I said, these springs um, are actually where you enter and exit the caves. And so you can do that through springs or sinkholes. And scientists use these springs as places where they can study many different things. For example, hydrologists, so people that study water, study how water flows through the spring system and they can use this bright red, reddish orange dye called, this is called rhodamine, to trace where the water moves after it comes out of the spring. And this is at Silver Spring uh, in Florida. And then we all, I've actually also studied turtles, and so there were more than 500 turtles that came into one spring a couple years ago, and they were like little lawnmowers that basically came in and ate all of the vegetation in the spring. And then what they ate was actually this invasive plant called hydrilla, so it was really interesting to kind of watch all of them eat just the invasive vegetation first. But these spring ecosystems are unique and they're really home to a wide diversity of other plants and animals. So besides applying drinking water, the aquifer is also really important to these really neat and unique ecosystems. And so this is the Florida manatee and they actually come into the springs during the winter months because the springs are 72 degrees year round. And unlike a seal, uh, manatees don't have a blubber layer, so they get cold. And so in the winter, when the ocean gets really chilly, they can come into the springs, which end up being a lot warmer than the ocean, and they can rest and eat. And a manatee can eat up to 10% of its body weight in plants a day. So if a manatee weighs about 1,000 pounds, it can eat about 100 plants, pounds of plants in a day. Besides manatees, there's also these little sunfish and I think they can sometimes see themselves in the dome port of the camera because they'll come right up to you and kind of look at you. <laughs> and even though we think of birds as looking or as flying in the air, they can also dive down. And this cormorant was going down to eat, find its dinner in the Rainbow River in Florida. And if you are, are live near the ocean or have ever been to the ocean and see these black cormorants, it would probably likely be the same kind. They come up into our freshwater rivers as well. But like these plants and animals, in the springs we also rely on water from the aquifer and it's a really delicate balance between humans and the animals that live there. So because the springs are made up of water flowing directly from the aquifer, we can use them to tell us really how healthy our drinking water is. And unfortunately we are pumping a lot of water out of the aquifer and also polluting it and we can see resulting changes in the springs. So this healthy, healthy native vegetation like this grass is unfortunately in many places being replaced by algae and invasive vegetation and some of them places are looking more like this. And when the aquifer levels drop and sinkholes can form more easily and wells and springs can go dry in addition to kind of being overrun by this algae. So because we live on top of our water, aquifer, our actions at the surface can affect the water beneath our feet and we need to really use less and pollute less and get more people to realize where our water comes from and get involved in protecting their water so that we can make sure there's enough left for us in the springs and also make sure that there's enough water for people in the future. So you guys are all future leaders and managing the water will soon be in your hands. And I encourage you to really learn more about it, whether it's looking through a microscope to see what invertebrates are, there are, are living in the algae or taking a paddle down a river, local river, to learn more about the plants and animals that live there. And also at home, you can help by using less water 
and also get out into your community and join river cleanups and get involved in uh, water monitoring effort, efforts, but really I encourage you to j jump in and learn all that you can about your water. So if you'd like to take a trip into the aquifer to get cave dive with me in the meantime, here's a link to the virtual tour. You can access it there. And um, I would love to take any of your questions if you guys have them. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was so interesting and I love seeing your photographs that really help bring it to life. Um, for all the classrooms out there, I'll send an email to you with the link as well so you can check out the 360 tour. Um, so we have a big group of students here and we couldn't be happier. And um, we're gonna start with Mrs. Annie Tully's class. So I'm gonna unmute your microphone and if someone can come to the front and ask a question, we would really like that. Um, do you want me to say my Hi, I'm Ben. Um, and my question is, um, if there's a very small spot in the caves, um, how do you take um, pictures there or do you not? Like, is there any way you can make the camera smaller? Oh, that's a that's a great question, Ben. Yeah, there's a lot of really small spots in the caves. So what we have to do in a lot of places, that's actually why we carry our tanks on the side of our body. So we call that side mounting. And so like a regular scuba diver, you know, you might have a tank on your back. And so we wear those small of uh, the tanks on our side so we can fit through a smaller, a smaller space. Um, but I actually unfortunately cannot make that camera any smaller. And I do wish that I could because it's pretty big. And it's um, sometimes it's a pain to lug around. But actually in the water, it's neutrally buoyant. So it's not heavy in the water. Above water, it's kind of heavy. But in the water I can't make it any smaller so the places where we can take the pictures are kind of limited by actually the size of the place where our bodies can fit so um, unless we want to start taking our, our tanks off and pushing them in front of us but that wouldn't really be safe for um, taking these kinds of pictures so but thanks for your question anyone else a little closer in case they ask a specific Oh, Allison, I think you are muted. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next, we'll hear from Mrs. Hoffman, Mrs. Robinson, and Mrs. Barber's class. Barber. Hang on. Barber. Shh. Stop. Can you hear us? Hello? Hi. 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 Can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, John Cena. <laughs> Yeah. All right, do we have someone from Mrs. Kaufman's, Mrs. Robinson's, or Mrs. Barber's class? Yeah, which one do I look at? Right here. Where would I find the information to, um, like, do a river cleanup in the town? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that's a really good question. Where Where do you guys live? <coughs> Oregon Town, West Virginia. <coughs> West Virginia. Oh, that's great. That's really, that's awesome. Um. You know, a lot of places, so in Florida, there are a lot of local conservation organizations and groups that support the springs and rivers. So I'm not sure if in your area there might be groups that go out and do organized cleanups um, or not, but there's there's probably, if you look at local organizations that support the river, um, you could probably find it there. And a lot of times they're nonprofit organizations or even, you know, science groups um, could also be leading them too. So if you look, look online, I, I can help you look if you'd like me to look for places in your area, but usually you would search for local organizations that work with the environment. Thank you. It's a good question. A great Thank question. You. Um, and now we'll hear from Mrs. Egert's class. I'm like, I'm like, Hello. Hi. Hello. My name is Emily. <coughs> Hi, Emily. What's, what's the rarest sea creature, sea plant you've seen? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So, basically, in the springs um, underwater, you can see a lot of cool things like the manatees and the birds that I showed you. But in the actual caves, there isn't very much that lives there, but there are these little cave shrimp. Uh, it, it, they're a little called cave crayfish, and they have adapted to living in no light. So they look like mini lobsters. They're only, some of them are only, you know, about this big, but they're completely white and almost see-through because they live in a really dark 
um, dark environment. And there's different crayfish that some of them only live in certain springs. And so I think that's probably, those are probably the coolest things I see every day. They look like mini, just mini white clear lobsters kind of. Great, and next up we'll hear from Mr. Gardner's class. Well, Ms. Moore changed it. Okay. I want to say something. Gardner, Gardner, what the heck are you? Mr. Gardner's class ready for a question? <laughs> All right, we'll come back to Mr. Gardner's class. How about Mrs. Chavaria's class? <laughs> really? Hi, my name is Jenna. Um, what inspired you to become a marine biologist and a cave diver? Hi, Jenna. That's a great question. So when I was little, I lived in Massachusetts, and I'm not sure if we have any groups out there from Massachusetts um, or not, but I lived by the ocean, and I was actually snorkeling in on sailboats almost before I could walk, and so I was just always around the ocean and absolutely fell in love with it when I was younger, and so I was really actually excited to find that sand dollar in the cave because I was obsessed with sand dollars when I was younger, so I was snorkeling we're not but going to make I think one thing that was really exciting for me growing up, not only just living on the ocean or living by the ocean, was you know, you kind of I fell in love with it first and then found out later that there were a lot of problems that were affecting the ocean. And so I was really inspired to kind of go and learn more about it and see how I could help, you know, help save the ocean or study species that live in the ocean to make sure that we could, um, you know, save it for future generations and make sure it's a healthy ecosystem. And so after I thought that I would study the ocean forever, but then when I moved to Florida, I actually moved to central Florida where there are no beaches. And so I found out very shortly after moving here that there were these freshwater springs and I started swimming in them all the time and found out that they were actually in trouble too and kind of needed, people needed to know that what was going on with the aquifer in the spring. So I started taking pictures to share that with people. And so I think just noticing that these places need help and need to be shared with other people inspired me to do it. That's a great question, Jenna. Great, next up we'll try Mrs. Mora's class. They did. Can you hear us? We, we can, yeah. Welcome yeah. to Mrs. Mora's class. Go my name is Isabella. And my name is Lily. Hey, go. Yeah. Hi, Isabella and Lily. What is the most valuable thing you've ever found under the water? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I've had multiple people when I'm getting ready to go cave diving. Well, first of all, they tell me I look like a ninja. And then they ask me if I'm going to see any gems underwater. And in these caves there, it's mostly just looks like rock. And it kind of sounds ridiculous, but really the most valuable thing you find underwater is the water itself. So because so many people in Florida rely on the water, I like to call it blue gold because it's kind of this clear blue um, you know, substance that flows underground and it supplies water to 18 million people here. And so I think that water itself, um, it is a limited quantity and, you know, we really need to be careful with it. So that's the most valuable thing that we have, have underwater. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And that's we'll a great try, question. Guys. We'll try um, to see if anyone else has a question. Did we miss any classrooms today? Maybe Mrs. Burritt's class or you, if you're there, can you unmute your microphone? All right, well, we have time for one more question. So if I'm gonna call on just a random class, how about Mrs. Egert's class? Do you have one more question for Jennifer? Yeah. Yes, we do, one second. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. My question is, do you do everything just cave diving or do, do you swim um, um, on the surface? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Chris. Um, I also love to swim at the surface. And if any of you guys ever visit Florida, you know, even if you're not a cave diver, you can jump right into the springs and 
um, go swimming there. And so actually starting in about a month, I'm going to have kids. I'm not sure what grade are you guys in? Are you third grade? Third, yeah. I'm going to have about 300 fifth graders in the water with cameras, and they're going to be able to go snorkeling right at the surface of the water. So um, there's a lot of gear, and it takes a lot of time to deal with kind of all of your stuff when you go cave diving. So sometimes it's nice to just grab your mask and fins and, and jump in the water with your camera and take some pictures. So that's nice and easy to do. And there's also a lot more light at the surface, so you don't have to carry 12 lights around when you do that, which is nice. But that's a great question, Chris. Thank you. Well, with that, I just You're want welcome. to give a special thanks to Jennifer Adler. This was a really amazing presentation, um, and a, a special thanks to all our classrooms as well. Um, there are many more events happening the rest of the day celebrating women in science and exploration, so we hope you'll join in. And these have all been recorded, so you can follow up later as well. Um, but with that, I want to give all the students a chance to say goodbye, and a special thank you to Jennifer. So I've unmuted all your mics. Bye. Uh, I'll let you have a Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much for coming. You're great. All right. Thank you, everybody.